Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, will you explain the solutions of the midterm exam questions? Yeah, that's kind of my intention. Okay. So yeah, I just started recording. So welcome. Uh, don't have too many people here yet. Um, so I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, personally, I'm kind of feeling better myself. Um, I finally got my first, uh, my first uh, Fauci ouchy. So mentally I'm feeling a bit better. So, um, and uh, although I was way behind, I, I finally got most stuff kind of caught up, although I haven't been able to get ahead of anything yet. So, so anyway, um, yeah, my plan was uh, kind of, as I said in the announcements, um, mostly we can talk about the um, um, exam questions. So I think maybe some people will be interested in those, especially I know the, um, I, I don't know if any of, of you guys um, um, are taking the comprehensive. It's coming up in a week or two here. So um, I know at least maybe one student in this class currently is planning on taking it. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, we had a couple of questions that might be similar to what you might see for the comp arc um, questions on the comprehensive exam. So we can certainly talk about those. Um, and kind of, like I said, uh, actually, I mean, our, we'll, we'll, we can talk about the number systems too, if anybody wants to. Um, to tell you the truth, again, you know, I, I hate apologizing, but um, if I had been planning more ahead, this chapter, I probably would have actually uh, assigned it like right at the beginning of the class, because I kind of consider the stuff is, especially for graduate students, I mean, I hope that you're, I mean, uh, that they, they've run across this idea of, of number systems and, and, you know, binary number and hexadecimal and converting things. I mean, you know, it's okay if, if, if you haven't, or if you haven't run into it formally, I'd be surprised if, if you've never run into it at all, um, taking programming class or something like that. But, uh, and not to mention it's a short chapter, so, um, but we can cover any of that if anybody wants to. But yeah, let's go ahead and um, look at the midterm exam questions and see if anybody wants to ask anything specific that we might want to go into. I have a question on question 20, 28. Okay. Um, the, um, the word offset, I used the word size, 8 bits. That was the first one with the set, set associative cache, right? Yes, the, the two way set, set associative cache. Right. And, and you had it where you calculated it from the size of the line, in, you know, in. in and I was curious, is, I think I was thrown off by the word, the, t the word word, um, <laughs> in the difference between the two. Um, and when do you, the length of the line, I guess, it, it, you know, in, in identifying when, which bits to use at that point, because otherwise, you know, I had the set right and, the rest of it would have been right if if I had just gotten a word all set right. So, oh, um, uh, uh, yeah. So um, that's a, a thing. I know that um, um, this is a good thing to understand. And, and yeah, this was one of the things I was thinking about talking about some more. And I might switch over here and try and do a little bit of stuff on on the whiteboard. But let me let me kind of first go into this. So. I mean, the basic idea is um, um, there's one thing kind of I wanted to talk about maybe is, is the, 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 how this is working. So, I mean, basically this represents um, an, uh, an address in the system. So there's a reason why, like um, for the, um, um, The, 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 this specifically is kind of the, the question about the sizes of each of the fields is, is what the, the one I believe that the Navy is asking most about here. Um, so, it, and, and you may or may not have gotten this by looking through the example, um, uh, reading through the examples in our textbook on the cash chapter. So the, the, the way these works, I mean, this, these bits are a memory address, but if, if we need to interpret these um, in order to work with a caching system, we break this up 
we, we break up all the bits to, to mean kind of different things, okay? So, and if you take the operating systems course already, this is very similar to how virtual memory paging works, where you have your page number and your offset or similar. Um, and if you haven't taken it, um, if you learn this here, then um, it'll kind of transfer over pretty easily to um, the, um, uh, the virtual memory paging. Um, so, I mean, the, the basic idea is that um, we're breaking down our address um, into what's called lines in the context of cache. And a line is just a block. So, so uh, these these names, um, you know, these can be referred to as blocks or pages, um, or they can be referred to as lines. And the, the the concept is the same. It's just a set number of blocks, a, a set number of bytes that represents a group that we're going to either cash in or cash out uh, in this context, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, figuring out the word size, the, the reason why that's directly associated with, um, the, the, the name might be bad. Uh, so I, I think this, this is what um, um, Amy was talking about here. Um, but yeah, that was what our textbook used. I, I believe we, we took this question directly from the textbook. Um, but yeah, the, this means kind of the offset of which word on the line. Uh, that, that, that needs to be accessed in, in this case. So for this particular question where we're given um, that... It's not, it's not related to the word size that's given in the first bullet there, correct? Uh, right, so it, it's related to which particular word on the line you want to access, you, you want to actually read or write. So each line has um, 512 bytes. Each line has 512 bytes, right? So yeah, that that word. I mean, to me, the, so if if you take the operating systems course, this is usually going to be referred to as the offset. So really, that that represents the offset of which of those 512 bytes uh, you want to access that you want to either read or write um, from the cache line that, that you find, right? So, so yeah, so, so if, it's a number, if it's kind of a name thing, um, that's, I can see kind of where that's uh, confusing there. But, um, but yeah, that, that's what it is, is which particular one. And so if you understand that, then that should make um, the discussion of why there, there needs to be nine bits um, understandable because uh, if, if, you, if you have 512 possible addresses or 512 offsets, so, so anytime if, if you have some number of addresses um, and you need to know how many bits you need in order to be able to uh, assign all of them one unique address, you have to figure out the, the correct number of bits when you raise two to that power to be that size or bigger, right? Uh, um, um, well, I mean, you know, it can't be smaller, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be two to the 10 because that's too big because uh, two to the 10 can, can um, address 1,024, uh, uh, has a 1,024 unique um, values, right? So anyway, yeah, two to the nine gives you 512. So that, that's enough to cover the, the word size uh, for this particular system that we talked about here, all right? Um, I mean, that's this, this is a general thing. So I hope, you know, that, that all graduate students at this point, um, you know, realize this relationship. So all the time you'll have, you'll, you know, you'll have something like, like a memory address space or whatever, where you know how big, how many, many number items there are, and you have to determine the number of bits so that you can address or take care of all of those, right? So... So if you know your powers of two, then, then that allows you to figure out those kinds of things. So two to the nine gives you five or 12. Um, so if you have nine bits for an address space, that allows you to have 512 addresses. And two to the 10 would give you 1,024 and so on. So, um, and then, yeah, from, from the hint, um, the, um, the number of sets, uh, or D is going to be a function of the number of sets, okay? Um, and and yeah, we we um, 
So kind of as I discussed here, if you got the number of sets wrong in the previous thing, you would get a, a different answer here. Uh, but assuming that, that you have the number of sets correct as 1,024, I believe it's correct. I mean, somebody can argue, but, but that's what I came up with given this, this described system here. So, so if we have uh, 1,024 sets, um, again, uh, from the argument that I said here, that means that we need 10 bits for that to, to, to specify which particular set uh, we're uh, in the cache uh, we're um, addressing here, okay? So the same argument applies. So knowing that we have 1,024 possible sets, that implies we need 10 bits to specify which of those 1,024 sets in the cache, right? And then here, I, I noticed um, in our test, we actually had a little bit of a typo. And, and I think, again, because I took this directly from the book, um, that there's a, a problem in the book as well. So, so I don't know if anybody remembers or if this threw this off, but, but this just said S minus D on, on the test question, which is actually not quite correct. Um, so I probably shouldn't be scrolling around here trying to find this. I'm, I'm looking, uh, anyway, yeah, but um, um, anyway, the, the, the basic idea for the remaining field, which is the tag field, and I can talk about what the tag does on the cache, um, but this field, I mean, the, the, the total of, of all of these fields has to total up to the same number of bits as the address space. So if you understand that fact, I mean, that tells you that, you know, if you've used 10 bits for, to specify the set and nine bits to specify the offset of the word um, on your line, um, then um, that that you know tells you by subtraction that you've got five bits left over for the tag here. Okay, so so anyway, that that was the answer I came up with. It gives you five, ten, and nine in this particular case for the number of bits for your tag and your um, set and your field respectively. So your, your word or offset respectively. Um, Okay, so if, if um, maybe, I mean, that's kind of a good place to jump back to part two. So um, it, it was easy to, to, to get 2048 as a distractor, or, or it should have been if, if you kind of knew what you were doing, uh, because if you missed the hint. Okay, so the, 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 the thing about a two-way set associative cache that we did talk a little bit about is that for each, um, for each set, um, possible set in the cache, there's gonna be two lines instead of one if it's two-way associative, two-way set associative, okay? That's, that's what two-way set associative means, all right? So, so this hint means, um, I mean, I, I directly gave that to you. That, so in a two-way set associative cache, each set actually maps to two lines or two blocks. So that means that each set actually is composed of 1,024 bytes instead of 512. So, so a line is 512 bytes as we gave in the system, but um, each set is actually going to have two lines or 1,024 um, uh, bytes. Okay? So if you keep that in mind, uh, and, and since the total cache size is a megabyte or you know, 1,024 kilobytes, um, if uh, you know if you do the division, um, you should come up with an answer of 1,024 um, set, basically, um, uh, given this information here, and given that it's two-way set associative. All right. Um, kind of as I said, I mean, it don't be, mean to be too stark. It, it's um, if if somebody can give a good good argument why you might get the smaller or the bigger, uh, or what you were thinking about that, let me know. So one, one, one disadvantage of getting multiple choice questions on the comprehensive exam is, is yeah, you can't kind of write down your um, thought process in order to be given um, some more partial credit. So for me, I did give some partial credit um, if you selected the 2048 distractor on, on the second part of this question, uh, because that does make sense if you missed the hint or didn't understand the hint about this being two-way set associative, you, you would get 2048 
uh, sets here. It's a little harder to understand how you might come up with the too small or too big number here, right? So, but oh, that's kind of a general, I, I didn't mean this discussion to also be for people taking or who will be taking a comprehensive, um, kind of a general, you know, hint. Um, I mean, we, the, the, us grading these, you know, we, we, we try to look for things um, to give people credit for, you know, and, and, and to give people points for, um, and, and, you know, um, and, and we want to understand kind of what your misunderstanding might be, you know, whether you're just totally lost or whether it was just a simple typo, you know, so there's, there, there's a real spectrum, you know, of, of, of how you can be wrong, right? So, so anyway, I mean, if you do have the chance to write down, describe your thinking and how you came up with your answer, you should take it and, and try and describe it as best as you can using good English you know, um, I know, especially if it's written, it can be tough to write those out, but, but, but that helps you a lot. Um, um, although, you know, of course, we see students on the other end of the spectrum that just try to throw out everything, hopefully, hope, hoping that they'll get something right, you know, so, so you have to strike a balance. Uh, if, if you don't really know the answer, you have to try and make a good argument for what you think is your best answer and try not to ramble and just say everything, hoping that you'll get some credit for something that's right. So anyway, just some kind of general advice. Um, hey, yeah, sure. Um, I noticed the examples in the books when it came to the math of lacking a lot, they would pull numbers out and they didn't explain well where those numbers came from. So it was hard to follow. And I, I was wondering um, before the final, if we we're gonna have these types of problems on the final as well, um, can we have some example to, you know, practice problems that we could do and discuss? Okay, well, um, I, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, I can't promise uh, anything because I'm, I'm still, yeah. I mean, you know, I've been, I'm just trying to keep up usually, but uh, but I'll see if I can do that. Yeah, I know that stuff, that stuff helps. Um, I mean, like like these, the, the other two questions here were just directly pulled out kind of from textbooks, you know, so um, I could, as an easy thing, maybe suggest some ones to try, and then people could try those and see if they have, then, then see if they have questions or stuff. I don't know if we'll be able to make good sort of example yeah, answers or stuff, but yeah. Yeah, something to practice, to work it out so that we understand where these numbers are coming from um, before we actually have to take the test is handy, and I noticed as I was reading, I'm like, trying to follow it. I'm like, okay, but where did they get the numbers? You know, they don't really explain that well um, in, in a lot of the examples. And um, I found it actually kind of hard to follow. I actually had to go back into the internet and look up some things and go, okay, from other classes that have taught and taught elsewhere on how those problems are actually put together. Um, and and it, it is definitely, um, I wish the book had had it better explained, but I found it very lacking. Um, so it made it, you know, these type of problems difficult in that sense. Um, so if we can practice them, that would be great so that we understand it better. Um, although the, the, the numbering systems, a lot of that we did actually in 516. Um, yeah. So it is a lot of review. I, so far, I've read most of it, and it, it's been all review so far. So okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, you know, good point. So um, I'll see if I can get some more things that people can do for practice and stuff. So yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and I, I mean, I guess just to finish up, I'll go back. We kind of went this in reverse, at least for the, the three parts. So, um, and, and, you know, we had, we had intended this first part to be a bit of a warm up on the comprehensive exam. So uh, again, this is just kind of a basic thing, you know, so, um, um, although, you know, it is something that we talked about um, in, for example, like, chapter three, the, the top level view here. Um, so, so, you know, a, a basic a fundamental limit, um, if, if you know the, um, the number of bits that are being used by the architecture to specify memory addresses, 
that immediately tells you what the maximum capacity is um, that the computer architecture is going to be supporting. And again, that's because you know if you have 24 bits, that means you can um, address two to the 24 um, unique uh, addresses, unique places, right? So if you work that out, that comes out to 16 million. Right? And if you know your piles of four, you know from the synth that two to the 20 is one million. Um, and and two, two to the 24, you can break up as two to the four times two to the 20. So you should be able to relatively quickly figure out that that should be 16 million, 16 megabytes. So. Um, All right. Um, so, um, if if you guys, I mean, I had one thing that um, um, I, I kind of wanted to give a, maybe a little bit of an example about this since we're talking about it right now. So again, I, I really do think it's useful um, um, to understand the these the the bit pattern when you're doing caching like this and, and, and what this means for an address here. So, I mean. Um, uh, you know, you get a little bit about that for the part four here, but uh, let, let's, let's try and simplify uh, if I can. Um, and I'm going to try and go to my whiteboard here. So uh, just for a little bit. So, so um, um, so uh, indulge me for a second here. Let's see if I can get this over relatively quickly. Um, so I'm not trying to adjust it too much. Hopefully it's bright enough here. So let's say we were working with, with a, um, uh, example on this problem that had 24 bits, um, for addresses. So, so let, let's simplify it greatly just, just to, 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 to work this out. Let's say that we have eight bits, um, in our, um, uh, uh, system memory here. Okay, so so with eight bit addresses, um, so I'll just ask. So, so what would that? What was the maximum? Uh, what was the amount of memory that we can support if we use eight bits um, for our computer architecture here? Anybody feel free to shout out or type it out. Two hundred fifty uh, for the eight-bit architecture. Two hundred fifty-six. Right. Two to the eight. Two to the eighth power is two fifty-six. So, so yeah, that would be the, our possible total number of um, of of addresses here. So, now if we had a caching system, let, let's say um, you know. So, let me start writing addresses here. Hopefully, um, So here's our first address, address zero, decimal zero, binary, zero, 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 right? So let's say we use four bits for the offset, okay? So these four, first four bits are going to be what we call word in this problem, the word offset, right? So that means that our line sizes in the cache are going to be what? If we're using four bits for our, um, to specify the offset in the cache. Every uh, 16. Right. So, right. So each of our lines is, is 16 bit or bytes here or 16 word, whatever the word size is. Um, and then let's say that we use two bits for the um, line. And then there's a reason why we, we consider the, the middle two bits for the line that I'll get to here. And then we use the other two bits for the tag. Okay, and again, let's say that we're, we're we are. Let, let's go ahead and make it two-way set associative, right? So, um, given this, um, or, or the, the not the line. So, yeah, I, I see. I changed the, the the name a little bit between the two parts here. So, also we call this the set. So, which line or which set you want? Right. So anyway, given two bits, how many sets does that imply our cache has here? Right. 
implies we got four. Um, we've got four sets in our cache, right? So given two bits, we can we can um, have sets uh, zero 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 one one zero and one one in our cache here. So that would be our four sets. So set zero zero, set zero one, set one zero one one. Each one of these would have a line with sixteen bits, uh, sixteen words in it. Right, and if this was two-way set associative, though, we would have um, um, we would have two uh, ways or two um, yeah yeah two two ways in each set. So like like in our fourth part of the problem, so call that way one and way two. If I'm not going off the edge here, right? So. Um, The basic idea then, and so for each of these, um, we're going to have to take. So, so if you write out your memory addresses here, let, let's let me write out some more. I don't know if I have enough room here because um, I mean you can see that that for the first sixteen addresses uh, in memory, so from zero to fifteen. Uh, all the first four bits are going to all be zero, right? So, so for all these from here, dot, 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 to one, 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 we have all zeros here. So what that means is that um, um, well, I mean, you know, all, all of those words are actually in the um, will end up be mapping. So, so if we need to reference one of the first 16, that, that's in the first line of memory here. So, so if, if, that, if that line gets cached, the, this one that I've got right here, um, it will always get cached to set zero because you know, the, the, that's what these two bits uh, in the middle here are, mean, all right? So, so, the, so, so when you're doing um, this kind of um, um, caching where you have both um, you know, we, we talked about the three different kinds of caching. You have fully associative, but th this is a, a set associative. So we're combining both sort of a, a fixed mapping uh, from a line to uh, a particular set with also with some uh, ability to be associative, all right? So yeah, in, in this case, I mean, all of the, these first ones from zero to 15, they map to um, set zero. Okay, and and um, you know just to show you, so if, if I needed to cache this one, it has a tag of zero. So all of these fifteen addresses have a tag of zero. So so if I end up putting this line or this block in the memory, let's say into way one. So now at that point, um, we would cache it into way one. Whatever the the current set of memory is would be copied into our cache into way one, and the valid bit would be set to one. Okay. Um, and and yeah, and think of this as the sixteen uh, bytes uh, here for that very first line that maps. All right. Uh, all right. So then, if you if you continue this on, so for the very next address, uh, we're going to go to zero 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 one, zero 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 zero, and the same argument. So so the next address is from decimal uh, sixteen to um, thirty one. Uh, have have these four bits, uh, but but that all represents the next line, right? So so if I need to cache this one, this will cache to set one, right? And in this case, the tag uh, is is still zero zero, right? So if I had to if I had to cache uh, uh, this line here from this to um, uh, thirty one goes to zero zero one. One 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 one, that would end up going to set one, um, um, but it has a tag of zero. All right. So the same thing happens um, for uh, you know um, all of these. Um, the, the the next one has a tag of one zero. So remember, we've got four. So so so, so the, the the next line goes to tag one zero. Or sorry, it goes to line one zero, right? 
Um, so that would be the next uh, uh, 16 uh, words in this case. And then the next one goes to line um, to set one one. I'm going to stop writing out the, uh, the the words on here, right? So, and then now at that point, so so these first four, remember that this represents the first 64 bytes of memory. But remember that memory, um, uh, our total amount of memory we can address is 256 here, right? So, but all of these map to the sets zero. Um, Zero zero one one zero one one um, with the particular, and the, but these all have a tag of zero. Okay, so now starting at uh, sixty four um, decimal sixty four. So that's um, zero one zero zero blah blah blah. Right. So this is the first time where we have a different tag number. Right, but this one maps again back into set zero. Right. So, so again, these bits represent if I need to cache these 16 um, bytes starting at decimal 64 here, um, that maps into set zero again. Now, now is where the two way association comes in. So, so now if, if I do need to save this, um, this line into my cache, um, and if, if this, uh, the first way is already full, I can still put a second line in there. So, so in this case, I'm gonna put um, tag zero one in there um, in my way two, all right? So now I've got both of my ways full for my set zero zero, okay? And then so on, and then the same argument. Um, so now if we go down to the next 64, so starting at address hex, uh, decimal 128, we're gonna be um, for our next uh, tag but it's at zero, zero, right? And if I needed to map this one into cache, that would be the, the, the point. You know, again, this one maps to set zero because of these two bits here. Um, but um, 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 at this point, well, the way I've done it so far is, is, our, is our set zero is full. Um, and, and we can see if I needed to reference something um, on, um, any of these, any of this line that has tag one zero set zero zero. So if I had to reference any of these, um, you know, I would check set zero zero by using these two bits. But then, then you would have to use the, the associative. So you you would look at the tag at that point. So I would see that that my way one has tag zero zero. That's not a hit. In my way too as tag zero one, and that's not a hit because I'm 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 trying to reference something on set zero zero with the tag one zero, right? And at that point, we would have to if I was trying to reference that, um, we have a cache miss, and I'd have to select one of these to be kicked out of cache. Let's say way one, um, and um, I would load in my. Um, um, into my set zero, I would load in my 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 line that's referenced with the tag one zero. All right. So that's um, and, and and again, so so what we're doing is is we're breaking apart our eight bit memory address in this case, uh, and in the context of our caching, then we, we use those to mean different things. Um, so you know the, 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 these particular bits map onto which set since we're doing um, a set associative cache here, um, and then since there's a um, uh, you know since, since we've got an associative um, thing going on here, we have to have some other things that that give us a tag so we can tell which one uh, we we can search among our different um, ways here um, and determine whether we've got. The particular line or not that we need to reference. Okay. So yeah. Um, so hopefully that that makes it clear. I mean that's the kind of stuff that you should have by by reading the examples uh, on the chapter four. You should have should have been able to kind of understand that in general that that idea, right? But the the reason why I decided that I kind of wanted to go into this a little bit more detail here was um, 
Uh, this is useful because, like I said, th the same idea is used in a lot of different places. Whenever, whenever you're doing paging um, or, or working with something where, where you're moving blocks of data in and out or around, um, you'll often do something like this, where you break up your address um, space um, so the pieces mean different things. Um, uh, for you know, even either figuring out whether a page number is in your virtual memory or not, or in this case, whether a particular set um, is in your cache or not, set and tag is in your cache or not. Okay, uh, questions on that? I was going to go back and kind of finish up the the fourth part here. All right. So, so yeah. Again, you know, um, um, even if we didn't weren't, weren't completely solid on all of that, um, there were some hints here. Hopefully, that would that would help. So, for one thing, you know, I didn't mention the valid bit that much, but but that that's again another kind of standard thing, and, and we have talked about this in terms of like uh, uh, um, uh, problems with um, cache and validation. Um, so, you know, the, the basic idea is if you have non-shared cache um, and, and two of your non-shared caches have the same line in memory and one of those writes to their cached um, um, set of memory, you need to do something about the other copy of that in the non-shared cache or else if that other non-shared copy tries to use that same value, it's, it's gonna get the wrong value because that value has changed, right? So, so a, 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 a normal thing is to just invalidate that um, cache line in any shared caches that are using the same one as another cache that, um, uh, that just did a write, that, that just modified um, a line there. So. Um, all right, so 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 from that, and, and and I did kind of some examples of that with with our smaller memory, but given the information for a memory reference, so we don't show all the bits for these twenty four here. Now I also noticed another thing is um, for this particular example, I really should have had a word offset with nine bits. We've only got seven there, but anyway, you know we don't really use the the word offset here. Um, so it just comes down to we have to match the what we call the line here on part four um, first. If you know, so so the 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 general algorithm for any caching that we did talk about, um, um, you know, there's like a, a state transition diagram um, in chapter three or four on caching about this. So you know, we first determine which cache line we need to look in. So so we we look in the reference cache line. Um, and since this is set associative, we search um, all the ways um, to see if they have the particular way, um, the, the particular tag that we're trying to reference from the tag portion of our memory address. Um, and then as a final thing on this question, um, we do have to worry about the whether that line is still valid or not. So it's only a hit if, we find it in cache and the, the, the cache line is still valid. Um, otherwise it's a miss. Um, so yeah, for reference one, um, you know, we have to just kind of pattern match here. So we're looking for the zero, zero and, and the zero, one, zero, one. So we found the line. Of course, you, don't, you should always find the line. The line has to, 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 to map to one of these sets or one of these uh, set lines. But um, you may or may not find the tag uh, because we've only got two ways, but, but many, many set lines map uh, to each one of these uh, line numbers or set numbers. So, um, so yeah, in this case, the tag looks like it has all zeros or it does have all zeros since we're supposed to interpret that as just a sequence of zeros. Um, so for this set, we find it. Um, um, so it is actually present, but then as a final thing, you know, we check 
uh, this is supposed to be the valid bit here. I should probably rework on my table here, but this was the valid bit that you were given and it was also valid. So that should have been a hit for reference one. Um, reference two um, was to the same line, but a different tag, but that one's also in there as well, 1001. But this is a miss because th that line has been invalidated. And so, so it's invalid. So we should consider that a miss and reload that line into cache here. Um, memory reference three uh, ends up being the, the first one here in memory. Um, and we, we're looking for tag one, uh, which you see is in neither of our two ways. So, so tag one, zero, zero, one um, is in neither way one or way two here. So that's a miss. That, that's a miss because um, the line is not present, not because the line is invalid, right? Um, reference four uses that same line, but tag one, zero, zero, zero. So that's this one. Um, and um, it, it is valid also, so that should have been a hit. All right. Hopefully I'm, I'm getting the same answers as I gave when my discussion down here. We'll check here in a second. Um, and then um, reference uh, five um, uses uh, the, this line we haven't used before, zero, zero with a zero, one on the part here. So this line um, and a tag of one, zero, zero, one. So we find that and it's valid. So that should have been a hit, right? So. Um, so yeah, it should have been hit, miss, miss, hit, hit, or that, that's what I got from, from the things that you, from these references that you were given here. Okay, I think that's all I had um, that I was gonna cover on ads. Was there uh, kind of questions about that question one, other questions about the question one? Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to cover question two or not. This is the one that that I think people had the least amount of problem with. So not too certain why. Um, um, I was expecting it to be uh, as hard, at least as hard as the second one. So um, um, we did talk a little bit about uh, calculating performance for a one level cache. I don't know if we explicitly ever talked about extending this to a two level cache, except I do, ex I do remember in, when I talked about it, that, uh, that, that yeah, you can, you certainly can extend the, the basic idea to two level cache. So, um, so to me, the easiest way to do that is, is uh, you can kind of figure this out from first principles by just um, uh, coming up with the idea that, okay, if I just calculate the average access time for the lowest two levels, then I can use that um, in combination for the next two levels, I and mean, you can do that up. And, and um, I think I talked a little bit about that in here. So uh, that's kind of what I discussed here um, with a few slight variations. So, so anyway, I come, I came up with about um, four hundred eighty thousand uh, nanoseconds there um, for the overall cache um, access. Uh, Notice, um, notice that um, our disk in this problem was 12 milliseconds, similar to our disk access speed, um, uh, a little bit slower, but, uh, but, but yeah, it's typical that you have millisecond access speeds when you're talking about trying to read or write something off of a, uh, a, a external memory, rotational media, um, where you're going to be working with nanosecond kind of speeds, uh, you know, which are millions of times faster. Um, down on cache and main memory um, access speeds. So. All 
Okay. Um, should I move on? Anybody want to discuss three? Some some people did have a little bit of difficulty with three. So um, um, this was my thinking on it. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of a note on that. Um, I actually did. Yeah, I, I, I wrote it in here. Um, I actually kind of had the, the wrong, the, 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 these questions were a little bit mismatched with this system description, although it worked uh, okay. I mean, you can come up with uh, uh, some reasonable questions, except really for the first part, because as some people noted, it was a little bit strange because you were given that. So it looked kind of like there was some sort of a trick there. But um, but yeah, the, 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 that was really just because it was, um, um, I meant to ask some slightly different questions here, given this setup here. Uh, in fact, I might post uh, the, the, these other set of questions just, just for some more practice on that, um, um, if anybody's interested, and, um, since you're already familiar with kind of the setup, it um, might be worthwhile looking at. So yeah, really besides the seek time, I mean, um, um, you could have just directly used the um, um, the equation 6.1 from our textbook um, to answer the part two, three, uh, and four here, right? So, um, or we'll, we'll answer to answer the um, parts uh, two and three. Part, part one was kind of given to you. So the eight milliseconds for the, uh, the, the seek time, average seek time. Um, if you want to know the rotational latency, so so even if you if you kind of don't remember back to this portion of the equation, um, so one over two r given rotational latency in some measure per second. So you know in this case we have thirty six revolutions per minute, which is equivalent to sixty revolutions per second, or whatever whatever your time unit is. You can just plug that in um, and get your rotational latency, right? So the only common problem on this is that if, if you want to know the average, you have to assume that you have to do about a half of rotation, right? So, so probabilistically, um, I mean, you might get lucky and the sector you need to read is almost immediately the next one that, that rotates under the head, or you could get unlucky and have to rotate all the way around, but on average, you usually have to do about a half of rotation, right? And that's where the one half comes in um, on this portion of the equation 6.1. Um, <coughs> so anyway, yeah, if you did that correct, um, you should have got 16, point, 16 and two thirds to do a full rotation milliseconds to do a full rotation um, and eight and, eight, eight and a third um, milliseconds to do half a rotation there. So, um, for, for this one, for the part two. Um, so what was I going to say? Um, oh, I, um, I was going to find another kind of meta hint here. I mean, again, um, if you are doing written questions for a comprehensive exam, I mean, you know, try and use good complete sentences, good English. I know not everybody's a, 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 um, a, a first a native English speaker, first language speaker of English, um, but, um, and, and we certainly take that into account, but uh, it'll, it'll certainly help your case if you try and be clear in your writing. Uh, but, you know, part of that is, is you know, it would be good if you, if you ever can, or, uh, you know, take a technical writing course or study about technical writing a bit, you know, so you should do things like try and make certain you always label your units uh, when you're discussing things, you know, seconds, milliseconds, whatever be clear about stuff like that. So, not that I always do it either, you know, but um, I try, um, especially when I'm doing notes for classes and stuff. So, um, so the second part was, what is the transfer time for a sector? So again, you could have used this part here of the equation 6.1, like we discussed a little bit uh, in class, right? So if you plug in, the um, again the, uh, the the rotation uh, speed, the total number of bytes on a sector, and then the number of bytes that you want to read, uh, that would give you the same as kind of the calculation I talked about in here. Um, although I did it slightly differently because basically, since you want to read one sector, 
Um, another way to get the same equation is, you know, um, uh, you know that there's 64 sectors uh, on the um, uh, on each track. You're given that information, so uh, it, it takes one sixty fourth of a rotation um, to completely go over each sector. So if you assume that you're starting your time at the beginning, right when the sector starts um, coming under the read head. It's going to take you one sixty fourth of a rotation to read all the data in the sector. So, so that's a that's a, a simple way. So, if, so if you just divide the the a full rotation time by sixty four, you'll get the point two six zero four. Right? You'll get the same thing if if you if you plug in you know that you need to read a thousand twenty four. Um, that that's the number of bytes you want to read but because we're talking about reading one sector sector of the time to transfer one sector. The total number of bytes um, is 65, 536. Um, and you have 60 revolutions per minute, so you'll get the same answer um, um, in seconds, in, in milliseconds, if you can convert that down to milliseconds. Right? Um, and then to finish up on that, you know, the, the final thing on the part four was um, um, just to, to, to calculate the, the total average time to satisfy a request. Right, so that's really just the sum of the three averages that you have. So the average seek time, the average rotational delay. Right. So so basically, um, and, and the question didn't really specify this. So I, I talked a little bit about that. So if you assume that the average request that you want to calculate the total time for is to just read one random sector somewhere on the disk, then you're going to have to do usually an average seek. So you, you've got that information, then you're gonna have to do half a rotation. So that's an average rotation, you've got that information. And then you're gonna have to spend the, the um, quarter of a millisecond, a little bit more than a quarter of a millisecond to, for the head to read that sector um, and get it into the computer, right? So yeah, you just add up those three things and you come up with about 16.6 uh, milliseconds total, right? So again, compare that to the previous question where we said 12 milliseconds was the average time, right? So, um, all right. And like I said, th this problem is kind of underspecified. So, I mean, it, it, here, if, 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 if you wanted to, if you had defined yourself what the, uh, request was that you considered that you're trying to calculate the average time for, that would have been fine, right? So again, this is another maybe meta hint for doing written comprehensives or, or doing a written question on our comprehensive. So um, if you're not certain, or, or, or if you think the problem is underspecified um, and you don't have anybody to ask, you know, so if you're doing the, the exam online and you can't kind of ask in real time for a bit of a clarification, I mean, just write down your clarifying assumptions, right? So assume A, B, and C. Um, so, you know, like if you assume that I was doing a um, high performance system where uh, records are stored contiguously on three tracks. So a standard request requires the transfer of three track, three uh, adjacent tracks of information. So if you did that, you could, you could calculate the uh, average time for that type of request in that defined system. Um, and in that case, you would have to use all the same things and maybe you'd have to use the um, track, track to track access time if you're assuming that you're doing something for a read for subsequent tracks, that type of thing. So that might have been one way you could work in using that um, if, if you were confused by this, be, ended, ended up being a red herring uh, for this, given the questions I asked of you, so you didn't have to use that unless you defined some kind of um, some kind of a, a, a different sort of request you wanted to satisfy here, like on part three. But you definitely didn't, didn't really need to use that for either of the the these part two or part three here. Um, All right, so anyway, that, that was kind of the, the stuff I had. Um, and like I said, you know, um, maybe I'll just 
a post as an announcement, um, kind of the, the some, some more, um, so I can get some more practice on this one. You know, so there were some actually different questions that were meant to be used to do some calculations with this system here. So might be good practice. Uh, Professor, have a doubt uh, yeah, sure. regarding third part of the question. Huh? Uh, while calculating transfer time, should we not consider the number of surfaces given in the question? Consider the number of um, surfaces. The number of surfaces, right. So yeah, this is a common thing that people gave. Um, and um, I gave some comment feedback on this um, for people that were using eight surfaces. So um, I, I, I finally understood that the idea was um, people um, believed that if you had eight surfaces, that implies eight heads, which is true. So that means that, um, for example, like uh, transfer time, um, in theory, I could ha be having all eight heads reading at the same time. So, um, so a possible correct answer would be, um, not transfer time, but if you're calculating like um, the a data data transfer rate, like in terms of number of bytes or megabytes per second or something like that. Um, so if you assume that you can be doing eight reads at the same time, you end up if you did it correctly, you'd end up with a number a transfer rate that's eight times larger than what um, is implied here on part three. Okay, but the problem with that is that hard drives don't really work that way, okay? So, so they do have eight heads, but you usually can't use heads in parallel like that. In fact, um, I don't know of any disks, regular disks that do that, okay? So you, you basically have eight heads just because you have, I mean, you, you can't really, it, it, it's too expensive to, to create something where you have to first move to the, to the um, surface and then seek to the track on the surface. So, so they came up with the idea that I just have separate heads. Um, if, if you look at the way these drives work, the, the heads are, um, they are not independent. So if you're on track one on the top surface, all heads will be on track one for all the surfaces, okay? So that would be one limitation right there. So, so if, if you wanted to try and use them all in parallel, um, you can only read, data uh, from the same track that they're all po uh, po positioned over at the same time, right? Uh, but again, um, hard drives aren't built that way because again, it's probably too expensive, you know, so, so only one read head will actually be reading uh, for, for the, the, the selected surface um, um, at any given time, right? So. If you wanted to use them in parallel, you would really have to, most likely it wouldn't, wouldn't give you any speed up unless you could position the heads independently on the tracks. If you could do that, then, then yeah, you could be maybe using all eight surfaces um, um, or, or however many surfaces you have um, productively, but it's probably too expensive to build the mechanism so they're all independent. So, so they're, they're really just kind of locked in. So all the heads, even though you have multiple heads, they all are positioned over the same track. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to take a quick break here, um, and then we'll come back and see if anybody wants to ask anything about number systems, um, or you know, um, take take a break. And if you, if you think it's more stuff you want to ask before we move on, go ahead. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's eight twenty, so why don't we why don't we go till eight twenty five, um, and um, um, and I'll see if there's some more that people want to talk about. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, um, let's kind of 
start back up or see if, if um, don't know if we'll have too much more to go here. Um, oh, uh, yeah, but first, before I move on, would anybody think of any other thing they wanted to ask um, while they have a chance here before we move on from the uh, exam questions? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, um, like I said, I, I don't think I have a lot of stuff. So I, I'll say one or two things here. See if anybody wanted to ask anything about the, the number systems material. Um, again, I expect most people probably are kind of, you know, familiar to at least some degree, if not a lot of degree with, with all the stuff in here. Um, it's stuff you really should have, um, um, come across um, in some form or another, at least at this point. Um, I had maybe two quick things that, that I'll just kind of point out. You know, to me, um, I, I think kind of the, the insight for, for people, you know, once you understand that, that number systems in, in different bases other than 10 are really just special cases of this idea of the positional numbering system, um, it, it, it makes it a lot easier to, for me anyway, to, to, to you know, uh, work with different number systems or to be comfortable moving around with stuff like that, right? Um, you know, so, so we all, of course, um, 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 grow up learning uh, using a base 10 system and, and, we're, and that's the natural system to use. You know, we got 10 fingers, 10 toes. Um, um, but, um, um, you know, and, and, you know, those kind of mathematicians, they, they always want to look for, uh, the, the, the most general kind of case, uh, that, that can explain a thing. And, that, and that's kind of what that positional numbering system is. So, so any system, uh, in, in a base other than 10, um, you know, we can, ex we can extend it and use these ideas. Right. So, um, So, I guess maybe another kind of thing that I, I at least is interesting to me that that um, um, I kind of wanted to point out. Um, so, you know, um, as we said here, I mean, the the reason why we use binary systems uh, a lot in computer science um, is, is, of course, because. Uh, computers naturally are binary, that they're naturally using two levels to represent things, right? So the, the, the natural representation of, um, of, of all data stored in a computing system is going to be um, as a binary encoded data set of, of some kind, right? Um, so the, the and the reason if, if you've never thought about it or didn't know, but but the reason why hexadecimal and octal, um, our textbook didn't really talk about octal and, and octal isn't used so much anymore, but but the reason why hexadecimal and octal you'll see a lot as well um, if if you do computer science courses or uh, have to work with raw data much on a computer system is that um, is, is is not natural. You know, and, and it's not easy to, to manipulate long strings of binary numbers. It's very easy to, to miss digits. Um, once they become more than eight digits, you know, it's, it's really hard to look at that and, and do computations with them, things like that. Um, so, so octal was kind of one of the first compromises that was made. So, uh, but both octal and hexadecimal work in the same way. So, so, so since they're both, um, powers of two, so, so uh, hexadecimal is, is just a base 16 numbering system, right? Um, and octal is using base eight, right? So uh, for, for hexadecimal, you know, like, like we said here, kind of um, um, if you group, if you need to convert from binary to hexadecimal, if you just group all your bits into four, into groups of four, um, and this is kind of a joke, but those are often called nibbles, um, as opposed to eight bits, which is a byte, so four bits is a nibble. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, it makes it easy to convert binary, even in your head, relatively easy, you know, because all you, all you really have to do is memorize the, 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 the bit patterns for the first 16 values. So in hexadecimal, um, you know, the, the, the first 16, the first 10 values, we just reuse the Arabic numeral zero through nine, right? Uh, and but since there's more than than ten uh, base values in a number system that's larger than base ten, we have to have we have to come up with other symbols for any uh, base values in the number system, right? So by convention, we use A, B, C, D, E, and F because that has the um, 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 advantage that at least there's an ordering of those that everybody's familiar with. So we use we map A to decimal 10 um, or bit pattern 1010, binary 1010, B to 1011, C to 1100, and so on, right? But yeah, I mean, if, if you can kind of memorize in your head uh, the mapping, you know, the bit patterns for zero through nine um, and the bit patterns of the mappings for 10 through 15 or, or A through F hexadecimal, it makes it relatively easy to convert a binary um, into a hexadecimal. You just group everything into groups of four bits um, and then you convert each nibble into the corresponding hex digit, right? So, so, so this nibble followed by this nibble, which represents 16 decimal, is just one zero hexadecimal and, and so on, right? So anyway, that, that's the reason why hexadecimal is, you'll see it commonly used because if you have to do a lot of stuff with raw data and you really have to know the bit, what, you know, which bit is in position 17 of this data word, um, um, you know, it's troublesome copying or moving around strings of 32 or 64 binary digits, but, you know, like, like a 64-bit binary digit can be represented with how many hexadecimal digits? It can be represented with 16 because each hexadecimal digit represents four bits. So, so if I need to represent like a 64-bit memory address, I can use a 16-bit hexadecimal re representation of, of the um, memory address, right? So. So octal used to be, I mean, it used to be that, that you know, we, we didn't use, um, didn't use word sizes much more than eight, 16, maybe 32 bits. Um, and octal was more common then, although octal always had a little bit of an issue because octal, it's the same idea, but you, but you group in size of three bits instead of size four bits, right? Um, and of course, octal, since it's base eight, you really only need the first seven, the, the first eight digits, zero through seven for your octal number. So, so all octal numbers just use the digits zero through seven. But yeah, you can do the same thing. If you wanna use octal notation, you can just uh, group things into bits, into three bits, um, and then convert that into the octal digit, right? And then vice versa, so, so it, it's also, relatively convenient to go the other way. So, you know, again, if, if you memorize the bit pattern that F corresponds to 1111, um, I can convert back from a hexadecimal to a bit, you know. So again, that, that was kind of what I was talking about. So if I'm working with raw data and I know that I need to know what the bit is in, um, in this nibble of my hexadecimal digit to, to, to understand whether a particular flag is on or off, um, I can just convert the six um, into my bit pattern. Um, and that tells me, okay, if, if I need the, the second bit of this nibble, um, it's currently on um, for hexadecimal six, four, here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, if you ever have to convert by hand from decimal to binary, I mean, you know, I, I usually don't do that. Um, I mean, I, I just pull up Python and, and use like binary function to, to convert from decimal to, to binary or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, the book kind of gives an algorithmic procedure. Although, I, I, I mean, I admit, I mean, I do that myself sometimes. Although for me, 
um, what I often do, like for example, to convert, um, well, 11 to binary is relatively simple, but for me, you know, um, instead of kind of going through the formal procedure, I would just know that this is um, bigger than eight, but less than 16. So um, it, it must have one eight. Um, and then from eight to 11, there's three left over. Um, so, um, 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 with, with three that there's, you know, um, uh, there's, there's no fours. Um, so did I have this wrong? Uh, oh, that's right. So, so, um, so, oh yeah. So I did something wrong on there, didn't I? Um, so, so 11 binary should have been, um, one zero one one. I, I guess uh, I, I wrote it the wrong way. So the procedure, I guess it should have been um, that way. Is that right? Um, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. So eleven uh, binary should be uh, have have one eight uh, plus no fours uh, plus one two plus one one. Yeah. So they really should be one one zero one one. I need to fix that. Go back and look at their procedure there. So anyway, you should get the right procedure if, or the right number all if you do it their algorithmic way as well. So. But again, you know, if you understand the positional system, you know, again, you can also convert this back to decimal if it's small enough by head, in your head, if, if, you, if you know that this must be your eights position and your fours and your twos and your ones position. So that this is eight plus four plus a one. So that this is actually a 13, not 11 there. So. Um, all right, and one other maybe fun thing or quick thing I'll mention. So um, um, also, you know, if you do programming, uh, there's usually going to be ways to specify constants uh, in your programming language. So you can specify something, uh, you know, to specify a decimal, usually um, you don't do anything special. You just write it like you normally would for a decimal number. But if you want to specify like a hexadecimal constant um, or a binary constant, some, most languages let, let you specify some things, you know, at least hexadecimal or octal. Um, some also allow binary. The, uh, the, there's no real kind of convention. So from programming language to programming language, how you specify a constant in some other base than 10 will differ. So in C, C++, you use zero X. Um, And um, actually, um, you can specify octal numbers using just a leading zero. So if um, um, this actually is a source of bugs, uh, if you ever write a number like zero, one, two, three, thinking that it's a decimal 123, you're going to get a little bit of a surprise in, in a C or a C++ program. You'll, you'll get a little bit of surprise because um, it'll interpret it as, a, as an octal number um, and it won't equal decimal 123. So. Um, 0B, 0O, and 0X seems to be becoming more popular as a convention for octal, hex, and binary. So that's what Python uses. Uh, a couple of languages are using 0B. So if you put that as a, as a prefix to a string of binary digits, Python will interpret that as a, um, as a binary number. So. Okay, um, yeah, I think that was kind of all I had that I thought was interesting on this chapter. Anybody want to kind of, any, any doubts that anybody had about the uh, numbering systems or hex or binary or anything, so. Are you get to converting between binary and octal and octal and decimal? What's that? Did it do anything with the octals? Um, but converting between the different from octal to binary and octal to decimal. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, if I had to be doing that kind of in my head or hand, I uh, by hand, I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, there's no easy way. To, oh, is, is there like a direct algorithm to convert from one to the other? 
Well, I was just one? asking if it got into that. I didn't get through all the way through the second chapter, so it was, it was a uh, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's yeah, you, I mean you could probably you could use the same algorithm to convert directly, I believe, from you know, so here we're assuming that we're converting from decimal to binary by divided by two. Uh, yeah, so so yeah. If I was doing those, though, I'd just convert it to decimal, and then and then back, and then into. So if I had to go from hex hex to octal, yeah, I mean, again, you know, I'd probably just convert it to the the, the bit pattern or into decimal, and then and then convert that into octal or something like that. So so yeah, it, it's probably a little rough to try and do a direct conversion from uh, uh, from the one directly to the other. Uh, I think it's into adding and subtracting the numbers as well. Yeah. Okay. Did you do the, the floating points, adding and subtracting? Um, the, so the I mean, yeah, I mean, our next, the, this is really kind of just set up because we're, we're going to get into actually representing, you know, floats and ints in a computer system, the next chapter, which is a pretty important topic. Um, but, but yeah, so, so, so we have to talk about all the, the little details about how you rep actually represent that um, in a computing system, which is using binary natively. Um, so how you represent your, your uh, uh, get all the bits to like for a floating point number, you have to have the bits to represent the, uh, the fractional part and the, 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 the bits to represent the non-fractional part and um, uh, well, we'll talk about that stuff so yeah and, and then um, how you add you know then you, how you build circuits to uh, do operations addition subtraction multiplication that kind of stuff so. okay so that's mostly next week yeah okay, okay. okay yeah. um oh one other um I don't know, this is just kind of a, a random or an aside, um, but um, um, you might notice that um, whenever I have to write out things like subscripts or superscripts or um, exponents, but I have to write them out um, in plain text, um, the, 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 the convention is that this pretty widely used in computer science and math is uh, you should use the uh, the caret. Uh, I guess I'm not to bring an editor over here so I can show these, but um, um, but uh, I'm, I'm really not talking about Python here, but um, um, so, so the, the, the symbol in programming language is used to, to actually perform the ex, exponentiation operator will differ. Um, Python doesn't use the, the, the caret, it uses uh, two stars. So, so five squared is five star star two, right? But, but, but yeah, the, the thing I was gonna just mention real quickly here, um, it's a good thing to get into is, 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 is pretty conventional. If, if you're writing ASCII text, like, like pretend I'm just writing text here on my terminal here. Um, if you need to represent, you know, like, like a subscript, uh, we normally use an underscore that comes from LaTeX uh, notation. So underscores represent subscripts. If you need to represent a superscript or an exponent, we use the caret. So it's a five, two, right? So, um, just because um, I mean, lots of lots of these things. When I give people tests and ask them to answer questions, and, and you're trying to type it in electronically, you don't have an easy way to create formula. So so you can use plain text, but use some simple notation to represent basic things like powers and um, um, subscripts and superscripts and things. And this is pretty conventional among mathematicians and computer scientists. So, what, what was the question, Amy? Oh, it's just really hard to see because of the way that the font is, and um, I had to like get way down into my computer to see with that underscore. <laughs> and then they just the font size is a little small for me, okay. so yeah. that, that, that's okay. It's it's there. So I was just like want to make sure I understood what you were you know you were showing. So yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
Um, all right, that's probably a good place to stop unless there's any additional questions. Um, okay, doke. Well, um, in that case, you know, everybody take care. Um, keep up the hard work. Uh, I mean, you know, I didn't discuss the range on the tests. I mean, most everybody, you know, got, you know, we did have down to the lowest was getting down to the 80, the, the, the mid eighties or so, but, um, you know, otherwise, and, um, you know, don't worry about it too much. If you got below 90, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to not make this course all that high pressure here. So, so you, you'll definitely be getting plenty of points from the quizzes and stuff to, um, 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 be fine um, uh, uh, with all the all the grades that I saw on the first test. So. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so, are you thinking we're going to stay online the rest of the semester? Um, yeah, although, well, um, uh, since I finally got my own shot, I might. I might see if anybody might want to do a meeting or two uh in, in a bit here um just just for fun just so we can see faces but uh but yeah we'll see so but, okay. but pro probably uh probably at most one or two just uh um, towards it, the end there maybe before yeah, the fire if people, are, if people are interested yeah okay all right thanks okay thanks a lot i'll see you guys later then Thank you. Thank you.